everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. K. I'll be your host for the day. We're continuing on in our series about energy, and today's title is going to be ATP Does Some Work, because we're going to be talking about the work that ATP does. On a side note, before we get in, and I'm going to digress a moment, thank you to the new subscribers who have joined our channel. It's good to have you. Hopefully you will benefit from these videos, and let me know if you get any comments or feedback. So, as always, we start out with our objectives, and they're as follows today. First one is name the three types of cellular work that the body does. Second, describe ATP as a high energy molecule. So what is ATP like? What's the structure? How does it get some work done? Finally, explain how the hydrolysis of ATP does some work. We're going to be digging back in your brains to remember what hydrolysis actually means. Our first topic is going to be different types of work that is done in the cell. Now, all of the work in the cell, all thousands or hundreds of thousands of reactions that go on in there, can be put into one of three categories. The first category of cell work is going to be chemical work. And this is going to be any sort of building or breaking down process that happens in the cell. I got some Legos off to the side there to kind of symbolize the putting together of monomers, the pulling apart of monomers dehydration reactions, hydrolysis reactions, all that good stuff. So if it's an actual chemical reaction that's building or breaking something, it goes into this category of chemical. Cell work can also be classified as transport, or transport can also be classified as cell work. Now this is going to be mostly the pumping and transporting things that we talked about in our cell membrane discussion. So it could be pumping an ion against a gradient as it shows in the picture there. It could be some sort of active diffusion or facilitated diffusion, although those don't take energy, so maybe they wouldn't count. But if something is being transported, it's going to go into this category. And then the final one is going to be mechanical work. That lovely picture on the right there is a picture of cilia. Mechanical work is going to be any physical movement in the cell. So it could be rearrangement of the cytoskeleton. It could be amoeboid movement as those amoebas go like this all through the water. It could be the beating of cilia or flagella. It could be the processes that help your muscles to contract. All that would be mechanical work. Now that you know the three types of work, let's talk about energy coupling, which is kind of the topic for the rest of our video today. The basic idea behind energy coupling is that an exergonic reaction is driving an intergonic reaction. Now, if you remember from our last video, an exergonic reaction is a reaction where something is being broken down, and when the thing is broken down, it releases energy. Intergonic reactions are those where energy is being put in in order to build something up. So a good way to illustrate this is through that picture that's on the right. This is one we saw in our last video, but just as a quick refresher, you have got an exergonic reaction. Our water isn't being broken down, but it is flowing downhill. This is a spontaneous reaction. It happens without the input of energy. So hopefully you remember that since it's spontaneous, it has a negative delta G. This exergonic reaction that is releasing energy is being used to drive the intergonic reaction of lighting this light bulb. So energy released in the exergonic reaction is being used to drive the intergonic reaction of producing light. Let's talk about how that is done specifically in the body. Our major molecule that is responsible for all this energy coupling nonsense is ATP. And you'll often hear ATP referred to as kind of the power carrier in the cell. It's the gasoline of the cell. It's the fuel currency of the cell, energy currency. It is all of those things. Big thing to know, energy that is used in the body in some way, shape, or form generally goes through ATP. Now, as is always the case in biology, Structure relates to functions. So there's a couple pieces of this ATP molecule that I want you to recognize. First of all, to your discerning eye, it should, re it should look something like a nucleotide because you have got a nitrogenous base on here, adenine. You have got a sugar, ribose, and then you got some phosphates on here. So really this isn't very far from being one of those nucleotides that builds up DNA or RNA. The really kind of key important piece of ATP that's going to do most of the work are these three phosphate groups right here on the end. Now, if you think of the name, adenine, boom, tri, one, two, three, phosphates. These phosphates, if you notice, each of them has a negative 
electrical charge, and that's going to be important in a little bit. Because you've got all of these negative charges next to each other, you kind of got a coiled spring situation going on right here. All these negative charges, they don't like to be next to each other. If you've ever tried to put two magnets next to one another with the same pole facing each other, they try to spring apart. Same thing happens here with our ATP. ATP is a very unstable molecule because all of these phosphates are trying to spring apart from one another. And if you remember from one of our last videos, most reactions want to move a molecule from a less stable state to a more stable state. So that transition is going to be what allows our body to transfer a lot of energy. So ATP hydrolysis and work. I left myself a big old space here so that I can do some drawing. First thing to remember is that ATP hydrolysis or hydrolysis just means that you're adding water to break something down. So here's how we're going to represent ATP. We're going to draw his little sugar and then we're going to draw three phosphates on the end. So this is ATP. Hydrolysis of ATP would look like taking a water molecule and forcing it in right there. When that happens, you get a DP, adenosine diphosphate, with two phosphates, and you get the extra phosphate that is left over, and you get a whole bunch of energy release. Now, important thing to note on this, this reaction, the hydrolysis of ATP, releases negative 7.2 kcals, I believe, of energy. That's how much you get for breaking off one phosphate. Now, what happens in the body is when energy is needed to make a reaction happen, this reaction will run, it will give off its negative seven calories of energy, and then that energy will be harnessed to do some work in the cell. And the next slide over is gonna talk about how that work is done. But essentially, if the reaction that needs to be done takes less than seven calories of energy, ATP can provide the power to make that happen. The way that ATP makes that happen is through a phosphorylated intermediate. Now we got some big words there. I'm drawing another quick picture. In the process of helping a reaction to happen, let's say that we are trying to take a triangle, stick it onto a square, and our final product is this little house looking thing. Now left on its own, this reaction requires, let's say, three calories of energy, positive three, which means that you would have to put in three calories of energy to make this happen. Our phosphate molecule, ATP, what he's gonna do is he is gonna stick one of his phosphates onto this little square. So if we were to draw this in a picture, we'd have our triangle plus our square that's got a phosphate hanging off. He is the phosphorylated intermediate and ultimately this reaction is gonna lead to our little house-shaped structure. Now, why is it important that this phosphate is on here? By sticking this phosphate on, this guy becomes destabilized. And if you remember, all molecules want to be stable. So because he is now unstable, it makes him want to hook up with this triangle much more quickly because this is a happier state for him. So remember breaking down this ATP, the hydrolysis of ATP gives us a negative 7.2 calories. Our reaction in order to make this little house only costs three calories. So this means that by breaking down one ATP, making this phosphorylated, phosphorylated intermediate, we can get to our house structure using just one ATP, actually less than one ATP to make that happen. In making this reaction happen, we are transitioning from something that is less stable and more reactive to something that is more stable and less reactive. So that's the whole point of sticking that phosphate group onto the square. By sticking the phosphate on, you make him more reactive and he wants to hook up with that triangle more quickly. Another thing that can happen is sometimes when you phosphorylate something, the shape of that molecule changes. This happens a lot with the protein pumps in the cell membrane. Stick a phosphate onto them, they change shape. When they change shape, they either dump something into the cell or out of the cell. So phosphorylating a molecule could destabilize it so it becomes more reactive, it could cause it to change shape. Either way, the energy given off in sticking that phosphate onto a molecule 
is used to cause that molecule to do useful work for the cell, that is energy coupling. Final topic for the day, our body would run out of ATP really quickly if there was not a regeneration system. So down there on the bottom, you see a reaction ADP, that's adenosine diphosphate plus phosphate plus energy equals ATP. And this just runs in a circle. So on the side there, you'll see a diagram. You got your ATP right here. Body needs to get some energy, needs to get some work done. So it breaks off the phosphate that gives us our seven calories of useful energy. There is probably a phosphorylated intermediate that happens somewhere in here. Once that whole reaction is done and our phosphate after the reaction is done, he pops free. So down here, we've got a free phosphate hanging out. We've got some ADP hanging out because this guy, the ATP lost a phosphate, so he's now ADP. We're gonna take this phosphate, we are gonna get some energy from food and remake ATP. Now, if we get seven calories out of breaking down ATP, it would make sense that this reaction of putting back together ATP has a positive change of 7.2. So it costs 7.2 calories to make an ATP, and when you break it down, you get those seven calories back. So I know that was a lot of, I don't know, high concept work today, and I might have run over my 10 minutes, but hopefully that little video was useful to you, and hopefully you will join us again on the Lab 207 webcast. Till next time, have a good day.